<laughs> so going through, going through the process of uh, trying to explain uh, to the PGA Tour how important tennis was to the club, to the numbers, to the operation.
to uh, Druid Hills Golf Club. I had the opportunity to work with Ben and his wonderful team. And I guess it was our first year, Ben, that we had the Alta Food Summit, where we met with all of the ladies and went through, you know, how to make the chicken salad and everything else. So it was, it was an interesting experience, to say the least. My recent move to Smoke Rise was uh, kind of an unusual one. I got a phone call from Susie uh, asking me if I could help them find a new general manager at Smoke Rise. And I'm at the point in my career where I wanted to slow down. And I said, Susie, I got just the guy for you. So, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm very excited to give you uh, my impressions and my opinions uh, of the tennis uh, business and how it uh, has really become one of the cornerstones of country clubs. Uh, it wasn't long ago uh, where Dad was making the decisions to join the club and stroke the big check. Uh, it's not that way anymore. Uh, any survey you see and any periodical you get, uh, golf is still kind of the gym, but it's fitness, it's tennis, it's dining, and it's the social aspect of the club, which tennis is a great part of. I've always said the perfect day for me is if uh, Dad comes out, plays golf in the morning, drops the kids off at the youth program while Mom's playing tennis. Then they get together for at the pool for lunch, and then the kids go to Kids Corner at night, and our tennis clinic at night, and that uh, Mom and Dad are in the formal dining room. So that's what we try to do in the club business, and tennis certainly is an integral part of that. So we look forward to sharing our knowledge with you. Our director of tennis, uh, Jeff Shanley, is one of our key, what I, we call our, one of our leadership team members. And our leadership team meets once a week. We meet on, on Thursdays at 12:30, and we typically meet for about an hour. We try and keep things right to an hour, and less if we can. If we need to run over just a little bit, we'll do that. But uh, I see Jeff just like I see the tennis pro, or the athletic director, or the manager of the club, or our CFO. He's a vital part of our organization. He's a vital part of our team here and a good piece of our business and uh, it's important for all of us to be on the same page as to what's going on week to week. We always start off our meetings with uh, an update. We go around the room and each one of our leadership uh, team leaders talks about what's happening in their department so, so we share that information. Uh, we get into what, uh, what I'm doing or uh, what's happening with the board. We talk about our membership. We share information with each other about uh, membership illnesses, membership uh, uh, what our members are doing, are they getting married, are they having kids, or whatever it is, so we can send personalized notes out to our members. We share all of that information. We share information about our team members, uh, who of our team members have uh, done something that's been over the top for our members, or maybe something that's personalized, so we share that so we can congratulate those team members. And then we go through any other kind of business that we have to do. Uh, each month, I think the second Thursday of each month, we spend 10 or 15 minutes going over the capital budget, see where, uh, where we are on the capital and capital expenditure, uh, as well as any other operational budget items. That's how we operate. <coughs> We're very similar. Um, with tennis directors is, is a vital part of our operation. Um, it's not only with the, the weekly meetings on Wednesday, uh, getting together, but it's, it's also individual meetings, introducing new members uh, to Ken uh, when it comes to uh, really going through an orientation, uh, going through different marketing plans, going through, of course, our communication pieces. Um, it, we have to have, uh, of course, a input from our tennis director. Uh, one of the membership orientations that, uh, that we do uh, moving through the club, introducing them uh, to the different department heads in different areas. Yeah, going down to the, the sports center, uh, having the time for the for the tennis director to spend with them, going through the program, going through the crossovers with the fitness program, the aquatics programs, uh, with the uh, child's the kids club programs. It is vital to the overall success of the club. orientations, one of the things I always like to refer back to is orientations that we've done 
understand the business you all are in as tennis pros and private clubs, especially as we're not in the tennis business, we're not in the golf business, we're not in the fitness business, we're not in the marriage business, we're in the dues business. And we've got to give members to pay their dues. The way they're going to pay their dues is by satisfaction and by utilizing facilities. So we try and drive all kinds of programs that are going on out here and keep, keep people coming down. We like to emphasize to all of our staff members, we say the first day of every month, we have 1,900 people making a decision. Those 1,900 people are members of the club. And the first day of every month, they get a bill that's emailed to them. And when they open that email, they're making a decision. And that decision is, is this the last check I'll ever write to my athletic club? Because we're not, we don't handcuff anybody in the future. They can leave any time. They can put them in the news and leave the facilities. So it's all about satisfaction, driving success, bringing the families out. As Jim said, it's all about bringing people on one campus. We've done our SWOT analysis here at the club, and we look at our strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And really one of our biggest threats, and will continue to be a biggest threat and our challenge, is traffic. Um, this traffic on 141 is terrible, it's horrendous. So what we try and do and what we have done and will continue to do is try and do as <coughs> many possible things as we can here on our 500 acres so that when people drive through those front gates, they don't leave. They're here for as long as they want to be here, whether it's kids' programs, tennis, fitness, golf, um, it's spa services for mom and dad, it's, it's facials, it's barbershop, it's beauty shop, plus all the food beverage, plus all the social aspects. But tennis is a vital part of making, making sure that all that happens. You know, one of the things that I've found interesting over the past 10 years in particular, uh, we lost a whole generation, in my opinion, in the club business, and that's, you know, my children's days, you know, they're now early 30s and late 20s, because they're the generation at clubs that were basically, you're to be seen and not heard. And it was really interesting to me, too, all these years, all these master plans I've been through in the construction of these different clubhouses, one thing was unique, uh, or one thing that was not unique is they always built these master plans where the tennis facility, the pool facility, was always in the same place tucked over the corner. What they were trying to do is protect really their golf kingdoms, but I think what they really created was a family center. And it worked out to our benefit today. We can take those master plans and say, okay, here's where the new synergies of the club are going to be. And so what we look at now when we're looking at the master calendar for 2016, we weren't talking about, okay, we got to have this golf tournament on this day and this golf tournament on this day. We had to say, wait a minute, we got to look at moving these tournaments because if our Alpha teams get into the playoffs, we're going to lose these 10 or 12 guys that are now committed to mixing. They're in their men's teams. So I think the directions of the clubs have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And you guys and gals in this room are in a great position for the future. Mr.
much. Uh, so I know it drew the hills, it was probably about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars up, so three hundred thousand. So you know, you've got to have uh, dues to <coughs> go to the program to make sure that you enhance it. You don't just throw it that way. You know, there's, there's planning and expectations that go with it. You know, at, at uh, Smoke Rise, we have a smaller dues base, so we've got a higher percentage that goes to timber to make sure a higher percentage of them. So I think it absolutely has to be fun. Uh, no question. It's all, uh, it's all subsidized. Everything is subsidized. And the way we work our budget process here, uh, Jeff is certainly responsible for the tennis budget as our director of tennis. And we start off by uh, Jeff and I. Jeff meets with uh, the CFO and myself. We're going to have a meeting, I think, next week, as a matter of fact. So to start looking at our, our uh, fiscal year, which starts April 1st. So we get, we get started pretty early on it. So at this meeting next week, it's just kind of a preliminary meeting. We'll look at our year to date, see where we are, see how the things are trending. And then Jeff will come forward and we'll talk conceptually about how things are going, where we are staff-wise, do we have enough people, do we need to add some people, do we need to change some hours, what are our hours of operation, uh, what kind of events are we going to have this next year, what events were successful or not. Again, just to take a really broad overview of the tennis program before we even look at numbers, let's look at the operation. Let's look at what we want to accomplish. Um, one thing we did this last year or so, and Jeff came to me, it's like, you know, we're so darn busy here. We, we were closed on Mondays, but we're so busy we need to open on Mondays. We need to, we're just, we have so many people coming through here. And how's that going to impact the budget? We're going to drive some revenue, but it's also going to drive some expenses because we typically shut this building down on Mondays, now it's open on Mondays. So utility bills went out and some other things. But again, it's all about membership satisfaction and bringing people out. But uh, that's how that's how we do it. Without question, uh, as far as on the club basis, it's going to be subsidized. Uh, really, uh, everyone uh, here. How many of you are from country clubs? To be able to provide the services, to be able to provide the staffing, to be able to provide the merchandising, the events, uh, the working with the food and beverage, it has to be subsidized by. Process. We have a small club, we have 300 members. Um, <coughs> a lot of private equity clubs, uh, the larger clubs, and take a look at the numbers. Um, you know, I sit down and go through it. It's much simpler. Our expenses are very low. Uh, most of it is built into uh, really the, the payrolls and the, uh, the court payments. So it's something that um, it's a much simpler system, but it still has to be covered by. reading now 
and looks, what books have you read recently, uh, and what books are you reading on leadership? And it's surprising to me the number of people that don't read, uh, that don't keep up on continuing education and don't read leadership books. And for me, that's a critical question because it tells me something about themselves, it tells me about how they value themselves, how they value their time, and how they value what their position is with their club. So that's, for me, that's what it's all about. <coughs> Everything you said. <laughs> and I, I, there's one I will give to you. Leadership is self-deception. I give that to every uh, department manager that works with you. So I would encourage you to go out and, and read that. Uh, you know, to, to me, the, all of these skills are absolutely necessary before you go to an in interview. And the one thing that I always ask also and, and demand of my team is the ability to, to make decisions. I preach this, and, and I know that some board members cringe when I say it, but I'd rather have a department manager make a bad decision than no decision. I can fix a bad decision. We can fix a bad decision. You know, we can make it right. And sometimes, you know, uh, solving that bad decision can be a big win-win for you when you contact that member and say, look, I, I made this decision. It was the wrong decision. This is what we're going to do the correct I mean, you make no decision.
yourself to take on a position of director of a club. You're moving for the first time from a head professional to uh, really trying to attain the level of a test director. Are you ready? Are you confident enough to go into a school even though apply for the
you know, I was a young man and uh, I was scared to death because I could really pull this off. So I called John Jordan, who I absolutely admire, probably more than anybody else in the business. And I said, John, how do you do it? And uh, he showed me, he opened and pulled out his drawer, and in his drawer he had uh, one group of files that was 1 through 31, which obviously represent every day of the week. And he also had a file that was a reading file, and he also had a file with the name of each one of his department managers. So what John taught me, and I did not work for John, you know, he just, he, we just became friends. And he was a good mentor, is when a piece of paper comes across my desk, I put it in a day. So today when I go to work, I'm going to pull out the fourth, and everything in that file gets done before I go home. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to put it into the fifth or the tenth or the twelfth. And the great part about it is I don't have any long to-do list. I don't have any to-do list. I have everything put in there. And I live by a simple rule. Uh, one, can I delegate it? That's my favorite. So I can delegate it to the CFO or to the tennis director or whatever. You know. Two, is it really important or can I just drop it? Is it one of those silly things that, that comes across your desk all the time that really doesn't matter? It, it doesn't benefit the club or you at all. If you can't delegate and you can't drop it, do it. And I look at, I'm going to do the thing I like least first. So at the end of the day, I can do something fun before I go home. So I think having a system and sticking to the system is probably the best thing you can do. And find a mentor. Right, keep that in mind. All right, now, okay. I am going to skip. Get to one more question. I want to do one more question for these gentlemen, and then we're going to open it up for a few questions here. Uh, Mr. Story, the last question I have for you is, when conducting interviews for your tennis staff, can you identify any constructive trip, uh, tips for eligible candidates? Uh, uh, I, I think for, those, for you to be a successful interviewer, you have to take over the interview. You know, that goes back to passion. You have to come in with a plan. You have to come in and, and, and have done your research. You better know the facility better than any other candidate that comes in. Uh, it's always amazing to me to see people come in and interview that uh, just regurgitate your website. I mean, whenever, whenever I've interviewed for a general manager's job, I've always gone in having already spoken to as many of the department managers that would have a conversation with me. What is it like to work at Smoke Rise? What is it like to work at Ruta Hills? What are the biggest challenges you face at Ruta Hills? As the general manager, what could I do for you uh, as the tennis director? You know, to me, going into, if I have a tennis professional that comes in and is interviewing and has a passion not only about the tennis program, but the golf program and the growth of the community at large, that's what I'm looking for. Um, ben and I used to laugh quite a bit about changing the name of Druid Hills Golf Club. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen in our lifetime, Ben, or your lifetime, but uh, it, at least it's something to aspire to. But, uh, you know, be passionate, come prepared, and the other thing is, if you don't get it, follow up. I've had more conversations with people that finished second or a third in the interview process and have gone on to work for me later because they had the good sense to call me and say, what did I do right, what did I do wrong, what did you recommend, and can I come talk to you periodically uh, about my future in the business. And we are a community. Uh, I've got a young man that is the uh, golf course superintendent at uh, TPC Sugarloaf right now. I introduced he and his wife back in 1989 or 90 when we both worked on the but we remain friends all these years. So that's what this business and this profession is about. And you all are an integral part of that profession. Yeah, Jim makes several good points, and I agree with everything you said. I guess the important part to before you even get to an interview is wherever you are now, don't burn any bridges. Now, when you leave somewhere, leave as positively as you can possibly do that. As Jim said, it's a very, very small world. We all call each other when we've got a position open and something's going to happen. Who might, who might you recommend? And you know, sometimes you make a phone call instead of having to make a phone call. Those are the nice things to have when somebody calls you and say, hey, I hear you're a great tennis professional. Have you ever considered leaving where you are now? So those phone calls might come. I agree with Jim also. Ask a lot of questions. Turn our back around. There's nothing worse than 
interviewing somebody, and you're really, as the interviewer, you kind of pour your heart out about what the job's all about, what the club's all about, and you talk to the situation, and, and then you say, what, do you, what kind of questions do you have for me? And the person sits across the desk and says, well, I really don't have any. I think you answered everything. There's no possible way that I can answer everything there is to answer about the club. And you ask about, quite frankly, in some clubs, who, who do you report to? Who, who is you? In some cases, you might report to the general manager, you might report to the director of athletics. In some cases, you might report to a tennis chair. But um, that, you know, that may happen. Uh, you might ask that. What is, the, is there a tennis committee? What is the role of the tennis committee? What is the role of the tennis committee chair? How often will I interact with the tennis committee and the tennis committee chair? Who has the authority to make decisions? What kind of decisions do I have the authority to make? And you need to think through all those things because it is a, a life-changing uh, commitment yeah, I fully agree with that. Just to look at it, find out in advance. Get a little, take a look at obtain knowledge on, on the, the position, the facility, and the people you're going to interview with uh, before arriving. You know, have some, some background before you go into it. So you have a little more uh, confidence and knowledge on what you're talking about. Something in your past employment, we talked about mentors earlier. Um, make sure that you know, your your whole uh, professional path uh, has been very, very positive, very solid. You stay in touch with the people that, uh, that you work for in the past. You know, so they, they're called upon, they're going to be saying great things about you. And any, any mentoring that can be picked up along the way, it may not even be people in the field, but it could be people that you've met. Uh, in an industry close to what we do, uh, that you stay in touch with and network with. Uh, you never know when the, knowing those people will advance you to introductions to other people <coughs> in the whatever it is. Your playing abilities. All of you got into playing tennis. Anyway, you got professional. <coughs> you got into the tennis field probably because you enjoy playing tennis. Is there anybody here that not enjoy playing tennis? Before you got into the, the business side, you all did. Don't forget about playing. You know, your credibility, uh, what, your your time in front of people, it's going to come out. They're going to want to play with you. They're going to want to see you know, how well you play. Things that you show them, and what you going through drills, and how well you do in those drills, it really goes back to just the fundamentals of playing. Don't forget that. Stay with you. We're just about ready for lunch, but I want to save about another five minutes for just a couple questions. So, anybody has a question? When you guys look at resumes, what are the top three things you look at? When you, when you glance at a resume, hopefully more than glance, but when you look at it, what are the top three things you look at? Well, I, it's a good question. I think cover letters and resumes are very, very important. And whatever you're applying for, any position, you need to know about the position and learn about the position. You need to tailor both the cover letter and the resume directly to the position you're going to have, the position that you're applying for. Too often people make one resume, it's like, well, this is the resume, this is what I'm going to use for everything. That resume should be tailor-made. You read through what I'm looking for as a, as a tennis director. Um, you need to figure out how you can take your skills and accomplishments and weave those into that resume right towards the top so it's going to resonate with me. It's like, gee, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And the same way with the cover letter. And I've even gotten cover letters, I hate to say it, I mean, I got cover letters that, to whom I may concern. I get cover letters that say, you know, I'll be looking forward to discussing working with you and your company. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously we're a couple, all those little kinds of things. But it, 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 it makes a big difference, and you'd be surprised the kind of things that comes across my desk. But, you know, again, I look, I look at uh, all the requirements that go in the background of what you've led and what you've accomplished and what you've done. Um, size of operation you've had, the number of people that work for you, direct reports, size of budgets, I look at all those things. Not only that, but also just how professional it is. It's put together. You know, it's, it's put together you know, very, very properly. Is it, is it legible? Can you read it? Is everything on there factual? Is all, all the different suppositions you had, are all the, the dates in line? Making sure that the punctuality is correct. The spellings. There's there's times that I'll go through a resume and just see all these mistakes. And it's gone. And it won't go any further. Be very proper in what you're doing, what you're presenting. Tenure is very 
report as well. I, mean, I like to see people changing jobs every couple of years. Assistance, that's one thing, but what you're the director of tennis, you don't like to see them a couple of months. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And then the biggest thing I look at is the uh, form and format. The cover letter to me is more important than the resume. And that mm -hmm. tells me what work product you're going to put out. You know, if, if you can't get it right in uh, a cover letter, then you're not going to get it right when you're communicating with the membership or your fellow staff members. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We got time for one more. On average, how many hours of sleep do you get in <laughs> Sleep? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm kind of an insomniac, so I'll, I'll sleep three hours at a clip, and, uh, and I, I read a lot. And uh, I, when I started in the golf business, uh, when I was 19 years old, and I got into a bad habit, I buy a book a week and a record a week, you know, what I used to up there, and now I have to download it. But I, 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 have a, I have a habit of a book a week, and I read a lot at night, and it drives my life nuts. Uh, some of what I read does. <laughs> but I think you have to mix it between, I like to do it one off, you know, a uh, business book and then pleasure read. And if you try, if you read too many of the business books, uh, you're going to just start regurgitating much more. Seven hours. Sorry about that. About six. I got no problems. <laughs> I can sleep pretty hard for six hours. I like that. You have one quick one? I know you got one. That time.
some of the things we're looking at now to bring back the fun in golf and how to speed it up. I spoke to the other day, I don't know if you've seen the golf surfboards. We had eight of those out of the club the other day. I spoke to the up and down. It's a blast. Okay. I may start playing golf again. But uh, I think uh, it's, it's the natural evolution, and we saw this in the 70s and the 80s where, you know, golf was declining, tennis was on the uptick, then you saw a down, downward spiral of tennis. So you, you just have to, you have to ride the waves. And the best thing that Drew Hills has going for is the tennis program up there is so strong. Why not reach out and bring some of those? So I applaud you guys being able to I know we've got some members who move off over to tennis and do all their work. I think what we see more of is the young members joining the club today with the intent of playing a lot of golf. But once they get here and they become, uh, they, they learn about the tennis world here, they go over here to the facility. I think we've got more people that are starting to play tennis and they have no idea when they join the club that they're going to return. Just to still slow down, because the time elements are here. Time demand on everyone.